This presentation is about Leila Ahmed's book, Women and Gender in Islam. The focus of this presentation is on the chapter titled Conclusion from her 1992 work. Um, and the purpose of this is to read each section of the extract that you have in front of you, the hard copy, to highlight key ideas from each paragraph and to annotate the text with the understanding that you glean from this presentation. I'd advise you to uh, watch the first 10 minute um, video that looks at Leila Ahmed's biography and context that really does set the scene for what she has written. Each slide is labelled with a paragraph um, taken from the anthology set text of the Edexcel Pearson A-level specification for religious studies. Um, so you should have that in front of you as you go through this. So if we take the first paragraph, re-emergent veil is an emblem of many is its meaning as the rejection of the West. Leila Ahmed starts this chapter off by pointing out that for the Western world, the veil in Islam seems to reject how modern Europe think that feminism should be. In the West, people feel as though men do not have to cover their hair or their faces, and so women should not have to do the same either. And this is a projection from the Western world onto the Muslim world. The re-emergent veil attests by virtue of its very power as a symbol of resistance, the discourses of the West in our age. Ahmed here says that, yet the irony is that it was the West who originally decided that the veil was a symbol of oppression and wanted um, to, to, to vilify um, Muslims for enforcing it in the Arab world. Many Muslim societies feel uh, as well that the veil has become a symbol of the resistance against Western pressure. And actually it's got a far deeper, richer uh, and theological symbolism uh, than perhaps it's become in the West and in the Arab world. The West as a, as a feeling of oppression, as a symbol of oppression, and in the Middle East, a symbol of reactionary um, behaviour against the West. She says the discourses of resistance and rejection are inextricably informed by the languages and ideas developed and disseminated by the West. Here, the belief in what constitutes the right of an individual is something which has been created by the wealthiest members of Western culture. And so the West has been at the forefront of disseminating a rejection of this veil that Muslims might wear. And so she lays much of the blame uh, at the foot of Western culture in one sense, as she opens in this chapter. Paragraph two, she highlights here militant Islamists, liberal intellectuals. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they draw on Western thought and Western political and intellectual languages. Now, it's worth probably highlighting here what Ahmed might mean by an Islamist or a militant Islamist. And so I think it would be fair to say that the broad definition of an Islamist is one who wants to reform or believes that they're reforming Islam back to its fundamental core uh, values and way of life. Um, so Islamic fundamentalism might be another term that's used here. Um, and increasingly, they want to see Islamic law permeate politics and society. And if you put the word militant in front of it, then you can get the gist that these Islamists uh, may do, in some cases, um, whatever it takes. And that could be military action. Um, it could mean uh, violent behaviour. This is not 
the same, however, as making reference to those who commit acts of terror, um, which often these terms get conflated. Fundamentalists, Islamists, suddenly you're, you're talking the language in the West of terrorism. And that isn't really what Ahmed is referring to here, but she is talking about those that might be considered by the West on the more extreme end of the spectrum religiously. So she's referring here to the reformers, and she mentions a couple of them. Uh, the status of Islam is being redefined upon how the West feels about it. And she highlights here a contrast between those militant Islamists, she refers to Marxists, uh, which would be in a similar camp to those that are um, against the West in many ways, and those liberal intellectuals who embrace fully the colonial ideas of Western superiority. What she says is that whilst they fundamentally differ in their political and ideological views, whether they acknowledge it or not, she insists that they draw on Western thought and Western political and intellectual languages. She goes on to say that in the discourses of the Arab world comprehensively then, whether they are discourses of collaboration or resistance, are formulated in terms of the dominant discourse, Western in origin, of our global society. So whether an Islamic militant rejecting the West or a liberal wishing to emulate it, both of them are trying to redefine Islam based on what they see as Western interference or how Western ideology might perceive it. Paragraph three she refers to an assault on secularism, Marxism, or feminism. Islamism tends, intends the restoration of an indigenous tradition. Here, Islamists reject the concept of feminism because they see it as a Western ideal. She segues here into discussing the core heart of what her book is about, women, and feminism. And here she says that Islamists have to reject feminism because in their minds they see this as a purely Western ideal, something which is seeking to infiltrate Islamic civilization. She says the West is everywhere in structures and in minds. Islam cannot go back to cultural purity that all of the Islamists often seek because Western influence is everywhere in the politics, in its technology, in its intellectual systems. It's simply a big, big threat. Paragraph four, Ahmed says, women are the centerpiece of the agenda of political Islamists. Here she's making a comparison to what would seem to be like chess pieces in a board game. Islamists use women and the issue of women as political chess pieces that are symbolic of their desire to go back to a cultural purity. Remember, Islamists are those that seek to reform Islam back to the way they believe it should be in the it was in the beginning which we're gonna to come to in a moment. She continues, discourses of colonial domination co-opted the language of feminism in attacking Muslim societies. Male imperialists known in their home societies for their intransigent opposition to feminism led the attack abroad against the degradation of women in Muslim societies and were the foremost champions of unveiling. She's arguing that it's Western men who have decided that the veil is a symbol of repression. The same men, however, who originally opposed feminism in their own Western countries. 
She then says, adopted and promoted by the upper classes in Arab societies whose interests lay with the colonial powers. So the veil became their justification for undermining Islam. This was then adopted by wealthy and higher class Arabs who wanted to align themselves with the Western uh, colonialists. And so you end up with a Western infiltration of Arab ideology and mindset, which leads to this conflation of the symbol of the veil in multiple directions. Paragraphs five and six, Ahmed says, what is needed now is not a response to the colonial and post-colonial assault on non-Western cultures, which merely inverts the terms of the colonial thesis to affirm the opposite. What thriving civilization or cultural heritage today, Western or non-Western, is not critically indebted to the inventions or traditions of thought of other peoples in other lands. Here, responding to colonialism so dramatically by forcing the opposite, Ahmed argues, is counterproductive as the world would not be so advanced had it not been for the sharing of ideas and inventions amongst one another. Cultures should not be seen as something insular, but rather something which can be shared out amongst everyone. And so she's arguing here for a better response to the past and the present. She says, rejection of things Western and rage at the Western world, an attitude that noticeably does not include the refusal of military equipment or technology. You see, Ahmed is not immune to the political corruption that exists and the hypocrisy that exists in the Arab world, uh, in both the Western and the Arab world here. We've already seen hypocrisy earlier in her work discussing how men the same men that see the veil as a symbol of oppression also have been in the past the same men to attack um, feminism and the rights of women in their own culture. And here the Arab world seems adamant to return to the traditional culture as far as women are concerned, as they want to react against Western interference. But yet they will happily at the same time in their countries rely on Western technology and military equipment. Paragraph seven, Ahmed says, it assumes first that the meaning of gender inhering in the initiatory Islamic society and in Muhammad's acts and sayings is essentially unambiguous and ascertainable in some precise and absolute sense and that the understanding of gender articulated in the written corpus of establishment Islam represents the only possible and uncontested understanding of the meaning of gender in Islam. The Islamist position on gender assumes that Muhammad, the prophet, had a set position on women and that the only Islamic way now if you want to reform it, is the only way that remains and should remain unchanged. And so Ahmed points out here that Islamists, what she goes on to say in a moment, is that Islamists have effectively got it wrong. She says that they've misjudged history, they've misunderstood their own history, And so she goes on to articulate why. She says the meaning and social articulation of gender in forming the first Islamic society in Arabia differed significantly from those in forming the immediately succeeding Muslim societies, including most particularly those of the society that contributed centrally to the articulation of the founding institutional legal and scriptural discourses of dominant Islam, Abbasid Iraq. So Ahmed is highlighting here that the first Islamic societies 
had a different view on gender from what Islamists have today. The message of equality that Muhammad the Prophet preached was lost during the Abbasid era, which is the uh, second dynasty, the one after the Umayyads, whereby society seemed to shift to that hierarchical tribal way of living. She says, Abbasid society. There's a syncretism of different cultures, Judaic, Christian, Iranian, were absorbed into Islamic thought during that time. She says, Islam instituted in the initiatory society a hierarchical structure. It also preached in its ethical voice. And this is the case with Christianity and Judaism too. The moral and spiritual equality of all human beings. So in Abbasid Iraq, Ahmed says that the position of women came from a blend of Iranian Jewish and Christian customs. This syncretism, this society had a mis uh, misogynistic bias. And therefore, inequality in Islam is not an Islamic custom that comes from the Prophet Muhammad's time or from the Quran itself, but rather from a cultural custom at the time of the Abbasids. And this is where she thinks that Islamists have got it wrong. And in fact, instead of having a reformed fundamental uh, going back to the, to the heart of their religion, which would be effectively emulating the Prophet himself and the Holy Quran, what they have done is cut themselves short and placed an emphasis on society in the Abbasid era, which wasn't is as Islamic as it could have been. Paragraph eight, Ahmed says that ethical voice was in contrast, emphasized by some often marginal or lower class groups who challenged the dominant political order. It was the interpretation of the politically dominant, those who had the power to outlaw and eradicate other readings as heretical. So this view of gender which the Abbasids enforced, was questioned right from the start. But unfortunately, Ahmed says it survived because it was imposed by the politically dominant of the day. And they had the ability to mark anyone who disagreed with them as heretical. And so it, it snuffed out the voice of a minority, the ethical voice, if you like, of Islam. Paragraphs 9 and 10. Ahmed says, It is this technical, legalistic, establishment version of Islam, a version that largely bypasses the ethical elements in the Islamic message that continues to be politically powerful today. It's this version of Islam, not the true, authentic, original version, but it's this version, Ahmed says, where inequality is tied up in politics and law and it bypasses the true ethical message of Islam, which is seen in the Quran, and this has survived today. She goes on to say, for the lay Muslim, for the ordinary Muslim, it is not this legalistic voice, but the ethical, egalitarian voice of Islam that speaks most clearly. The egalitarian voice, those that want to reject elitism and argue that all people, no matter what your background, are equal. You see, the average Muslim woman is returning focus, Ahmed says, to equality rather than these political agendas which have clouded the judgment of the ordinary Muslim. Only within the politically powerful version of Islam, she says, no greater claim than papal Christianity is women's position immutably fixed as subordinate. It's only 
in the most political forms of Islam that women are seen as inferior. But this is no more a reflection of Islam than the Pope is a reflection of Christianity. And Ahmed is pointing out here that this happens when religion and politics seem to get highly involved with each other. And you see this in institutional religion, as she makes reference earlier, if you remember, to established Islam or legalistic Islam. Paragraph 11. She says, the Islamist position with respect to the distant past is flawed. In assuming that the legacy was open to only one interpretation on matters of gender and that the correct interpretation was the one captured and preserved in the corpus of Muslim thought and writing and constituting the heritage of establishment Islam, created decades and indeed centuries after Muhammad in the societies of the Middle East. Reinforcing what we've just read, the very thing that Islamists argue against, which is Islam being polluted by other cultures like the West, already happened in the first place, she says, when the Abbasids distorted the message of Islam in regards to how women should be treated. Another irony there. She continues, Islamists assume that identifying the rulings regarding gender current in the first Muslim society, rulings presumed to be ascertainable in some categorical fashion, and transposing and applying them to modern Muslim societies would result in the reconstitution of the meaning of gender inhering and articulated in that first society. You see, she says here that Islamists assume that by returning to the Islamic culture of the Abbasids, somehow Islam will become unpolluted by Western ideals. But this is all hinged, Ahmed says, on assuming that the Abbasids had the correct interpretation in the first place. She continues, the transposition of a segment of the Arabian Muslim society's discourse even if this were absolutely ascertainable, to the fundamentally different Muslim societies of the Muslim modern world is likely to result not in the reconstitution of the first Arabian Muslim understanding of gender, but rather in its travesty. And so she concludes this part about the Abbasids influencing the Islamists and says that returning to the Abbasid views on gender is not making Islam pure again, she argues it's returning to their mistakes. Paragraphs 12 and 13. Ahmed says the social system is devised and informed, was one that controlled and subordinated women, marginalised them economically, and arguably conceptualised them as human beings inferior to men. The systems of law that the Middle East developed was one, she says, that marginalised and segregated women on all levels, viewing them as inferior to men. She goes on to say that evidently, dissent from this dominant view existed and found formal expression in the thought of such groups as the Sufis and the Karmatians, and in the thought of a rare philosopher like Ibn al-Arabi, evidently too informal resistance to the dominant culture was found within families and among individuals. And I want us to focus here on Sufis. It mentions just before that section that I read the theologian al-Ghazali, who we know was a heavily influential Sufi. There was some dissent from this view, the system of law developed in the Middle East. And when we look at the emergence of Sufism, and in some individuals and families, we can find this dissent. 
She goes on to say that families economically in a position to contractually impose monogamy on their daughter's spouse or otherwise protect her interests in marriage sometimes did impose such terms. Some families educated their daughters. So wealthier families would protect their daughters' interests in marriage and they would educate them. So inequality still, however, here existing. But the unravelling of this system began to occur with European economic encroachment in about the early 19th century. So what started to threaten or break up these uh, Middle Eastern system of, of law that existed, well, these gender systems began to unravel when economy and trade relationships were partnered and developed with Europe. So you can see where this is going. Paragraph 14, Ahmed says, in the course of the last century or so, women in a significant number of Arab countries have attained civil and political rights and virtually equal access to education, at least in so far as public policies are concerned. So Muslim women, she's arguing, are and should be quite happy with these changes because it's given them better access to resources like education, political rights, and equality. These things would, I don't think, from the, for the majority of Muslims be considered a problem. In fact, they talk about equality. These are things that the Prophet Muhammad himself um, promoted and embraced when it came to women. But what we're looking at here, what Ahmed is focusing on here, is the dissembling of this Middle Eastern uh, system of law that has, in the Western views and in the Islamist views, effectively repressed women in some way. And so the trade relationships with Europe have opened the door to some of these changes. And she highlights some of the positive influences of these changes here. She goes on to say a significant number of Arab countries, women have gained or are gaining entry into virtually all the professions from teaching and nursing to medicine, law and engineering. So a significant amount of women are now allowed into professions that were previously only reserved for men. She says, broadly speaking, most Middle Eastern nations have moved or are moving toward adopting the Western political language of human and political rights. So change in the Arab countries has been happening at a variable rate, but most are now slowly moving towards Western equality. Ahmed goes on to say in paragraphs 15 and 16, there are two kinds of exceptions to this tendency. The societies in the Arabian Peninsula, least subject to European economic, cultural or political domination, and least open generally to other cultures and ideas, in response to increasing exposure to global influences, particularly Saudi Arabia, have attempted to erect yet more impregnable cultural and ideological walls. Islamic family law, is the second. The laws governing men's and women's rights in marriage, divorce and child custody. These laws have remained profoundly resistant to change. So let's break that down. She's saying here that there are exceptions to this development in the Arab world, this progression towards Western equality. She says those societies in the Arab Peninsula are the areas least prone to influence from European economy, politics or culture. All the societies in the area, like she names Saudi Arabia, have made their laws around women far tighter. And this is a response to Western interference. Secondly, she says there's been no movement in equal rights for women in matters of family law and custody. Those laws have been resistant to change. She then says feminists in many Muslim societies have persistently mounted attempts to introduce reforms. And so feminists in these Muslim countries are repeatedly campaigning for reform. As a consequence, 
of some of the uh, lack of progression amongst the uh, societies in the Arab Peninsula and also for this what might be considered by many feminists a backwards um, or, or static uh, m issue with family law and custody where there's been no movement hardly at all. Paragraph 17, she says family law is the cornerstone of the system of male privilege set up by establishment Islam. Again, using that phrase, establishment Islam. And so she particularly lays blame at this family law problem, where there's been really no progression for women in Arab countries. She says family law is a clear reflection of rules that are set by men in a political form of Islam. She later says the misogynistic rhetoric that they let loose into the social system implicitly sanctions male violence towards women and sets up women rather than the corruptions and bankruptcies of the government as targets of male frustration at poverty and powerlessness. Here in countries like Iran and Pakistan, she's saying men have taken out their frustration at being poor, which is really a product of a poorly led government. But instead, they've taken their frustration, she says, out on women, when what they really needed to be was focused on the corruption of their governments. She then says limiting their access to remunerative work deprives their societies of the creativity and productivity that women throughout the world have proven themselves to be capable of. She's arguing here that it's completely counterproductive for these countries and these societies which would have benefited from having the creativity and the intelligence of women in the workforce is completely counterproductive for them to limit their access to this kind of work. Paragraph 18. She says clearly, the Islam such government set up bears no relation to an Islam reinterpreted to give precedence to the ethical voice of Islam. And she's making that continual distinction throughout this book. That the Islam which governments have set up, the establishment Islam, the political Islam, has no relation to the ethical voice of Islam, which she says is firmly found in the Quran. Really what she's saying is, is that where women may not be treated well in parts of the Middle East, in Islamic countries, this is a product of governments, of culture, of politicization. This is not a product of the Quran, the message of Islam. This whole paragraph here, which I won't read in its entirety, is arguing that governments which enforce the laws, which make women inferior, are ignoring the ethical and universal message of Islam. And that message preaches equality, justice and human rights. Ahmed in her work here isn't seeking to redefine a new kind of Islam. She's arguing that if you truly go back to the message of Islam, it's universal. It's a message that the West want to have. It's a message that the lay Muslim wants to have. A message of equality, justice and human rights. A message which the Prophet Muhammad, she believes, clearly preached in his life. She does go on to say here that the earlier Islamic period in which misogyny and androcentrism were the uncontested and invisible norms strove to render Islamic precepts into laws that expressed justice. In contrast, their descendants today are choosing to eschew where it comes to women, contemporary understandings of the meanings of justice and human rights, even as they adopt modern technologies and languages in every other domain of life. Again, reinforcing 
the main problem here that the earliest Islamic governments made up the rules of Islam at the time because misogyny was something of the norm. But now today, governments, she says, which choose to keep following and, and perpetuating those rules are purposefully ignoring modern understandings of people's basic human rights. Paragraph 19, she says, deferring justice to women until rights and prosperity have been won for all men to no less an extent, is no less an extent than rejecting the West in favour of a return to indigenous culture while allowing the mental and technological appurtenances of the West to permeate society without barrier. Reinstating the rules which oppress women, she says, is as counterproductive as pushing anti-Western propaganda whilst benefiting from Western technology. Again, this hypocrisy, this contradiction where those Islamists who are anti-Western and promote an anti-Western agenda, these Arab nations yet at the same time will benefit from Western technology. Paragraph 20. She says it was in this discourse of colonial feminism that progress for women could be achieved only through abandoning the native culture. The only reason that parts of the Arab world, she says, seem resistant to feminism is because it's associated with colonial, uh, colonialism. And this is why there has been a link made between feminism and abandoning culture. And so Ahmed is arguing that feminism, if separated from it, this kind of colonial history, it would then be clear that there's no need to abandon all of your culture to embrace some form of feminism. She goes on to say the history of Western women actually makes this clear. There is no validity to the notion that progress for women can be achieved only by abandoning the ways of a native androcentric culture in favour of those of another culture. It was never argued, for instance, even by the most ardent 19th century feminists, that European women could liberate themselves from the oppressiveness of Victorian dress. So here she's making a case that in order to embrace feminism, Islam, to embrace feminism, doesn't need to reject its culture. And she says it's incorrect. And in fact, you can take a leaf out of the Western book here. Because even if you look at the rise of feminism in the West, changing restrictive dress has nothing to do with adopting another culture. In the Victorian era, when they removed the corset, which often led to suffocation, it, le it led to ribs cracking, it was a very painful, restrictive and oppressive garment for a woman to wear. That didn't mean adopting another culture entirely, because the Victorians moved away from the corset but they didn't adopt another culture to do that. They just redefined their own. She goes on to say, only by adopting the dress of some other culture. Nor has it ever been argued when European women had no rights, even by the most radical feminists. The only recourse for Western women is to abandon Western culture and find themselves some other culture. So it was never suggested, even by the most radical of feminists, that because the West oppressed women, that therefore Western women should now adopt another culture entirely. Here Ahmed makes the case that being progressive doesn't mean abandonment. Paragraph 
and she's preaching here to the Islamists. And she goes on to say, to this day, the struggle against the veil and toward westernization and the abandoning of backward and oppressive Arab Muslim ways is still commonly the frame story within which Western-based studies of Arab women, including feminist studies, are presented. You see, Ahmed believes that in her research and studies of Western understanding of the Arab world, that there is a an uncalled for bias in feminist literature portraying the Arab woman in a way that isn't helpful. Feminism in Islam is always portrayed as a struggle against the veil. And that's, she argues, put down to the works of earlier colonialists like the Earl of Cromer, um, Evelyn Bearing, the first Earl of Cromer, um, he was a traditional Orientalist who um, argued that the West, Western people are superior to Arabs and those of the Orient. And his view was that Arabs treated women in a terrible way. And he led on the unveiling campaigns at the time, mostly with his focus set on Egypt, which is why Leila Ahmed, no doubt, makes reference to him. And she's arguing here that the agenda of those like the Earl of Cromer uh, has what has influenced uh, Western feminist literature today, and it still is an influence today, this unveiling idea, this argument that women should unveil uh, in Arab countries because it's an oppressive symbol. Paragraph 21. Ahmed says, The presumption underlying these ideas is that Western women may pursue feminist goals by engaging critically with and challenging and redefining their cultural heritage. But Muslim women can pursue such goals only by setting aside the ways of their culture for the non-androcentric, non-misogynistic ways, such as the implication of the West. And Ahmed continues here saying that there's an assumption that Western women may pursue feminism by redefining their position in society but yet somehow, in order to do the same, Muslim women have to abandon their whole culture. And Ahmed's saying that's an unfair expectation, and a hypocritical one at that, of Western feminism. She says Islam and Arabic cultures, no less than the religions and cultures of the West, are open to reinterpretation and change. So actually, it's not about Muslim women having to accept Western ideals, but it's rather the Muslim world accepting, just like the West has, that culture can be open to change, progression and adaptation. She goes on to say, women in Western societies were able to draw at the time on the political vocabularies and systems that were generated by ideas of democracy and the rights of the individual vocabularies and political systems, all developed, as it happens, by white male middle classes to safeguard their interests and not intended to be applicable to women. Ahmed points out here that a great thing happened where Western cultures were once that were once too male dominated. But Western women drew upon the laws that men themselves had made for themselves and used them to argue for an equal position, for a similar position. She concludes this paragraph saying that Arab Muslim women need to reject, just as Western women are trying to reject, the androcentricism of whatever culture or tradition in which they find themselves. But that is quite different from the saying they need, from saying that they need to adopt Western customs, goals and lifestyles. <laughs>
She says Arab women, just like Western women, need to reject inequality. This doesn't mean adopting a Western culture. That's not what Ahmed is arguing for in this book. She says it means changing theirs in order that it is fair. Paragraphs 22 and 23. Firstly, we can pick out, she says, Arab and Muslim oppression of women is invoked in Western media. Unfortunately, Ahmed draws the conclusion that oppression of women is used by the Western media to promote a hatred of Islam. And that in turn understandably makes Arab countries more determined to hold on to their rules which promote inequality. While she's got some positive things to frame about Western ideology and progression of feminism for women and their rights, she also points out here that the West are mostly to blame for keeping Arab countries in that place of refusing to progress and adapt because they see it as a Western assault on their culture and their religion. She refers back to the Earl of Cromer and says he put forward that the measure of whether Muslim women were liberated or not lay in whether they veiled and whether the particular society had become progressive and westernized or insisted on clinging to Arab and Islamic ways. She's comparing the influence of the Earl of Cromer and his work in leading on the unveiling campaigns and saying that this is really what the West are arguing for of Arab countries. And this is because Lord Cromer, the first consul of Egypt, promoted a view as we've heard, that the measure of how progressive an Islamic society is, is shown by how many women abandon the veil. And he believed that was the test of whether this Arab country was going to be able to be progressive, whether Islamic society would change. But feminism could also be argued to be ignoring this oppression, demand and by wearing the veil regardless. In other words, um, what Ahmed is arguing here is that actually not much has changed since the days of Cromer and that feminists, in a very subtle way perhaps, are still clinging on to this colonial idea, this classist idea, that Arab Muslim women, in order to be truly feminist, must give up their veil, give up their culture. And Ahmed is saying that isn't what feminism should be arguing for. And this whole paragraph, which I won't read in its entirety, Ahmed is saying by consistently focusing on the issues surrounding women in the Arab world, it is making the Arab world more resistant to change. And therefore it serves to promote the view to the rest of the world that they are a backward culture in need of domination and correction. So what's the difference between the colonial days and post-colonial days where the West still is putting forward this view that the Arab world is backward, its culture needs domination, it needs correction, and women need to unveil. Ahmed said these things exacerbate the issue uh, and, and create a stubbornness in the Middle East, in Arab countries, in Islamic society, where Islamists in particular will see this as a great threat to their culture and religion. And finally, paragraph 24, she concludes this chapter by saying, research on Arab women is a much younger field. It is often assumed that modernity and progress and westernization are incontestably good. So there's very little in terms of Arab writings by women on this issue. And research on Arab women is in its infancy. However, from what there is, Ahmed says it seems that Arab women consider modernity to be a good thing. She then 
makes reference to the Indian anthropologist T.N. Madan, suggests that a productive starting point could be looking to other cultures in an attitude of respect and an acknowledgement of their affording opportunities for critiquing and enhancing awareness of the investigator's culture. So the issues have stemmed from the way that the West have approached other cultures. She's arguing that the West need to do it more respectfully from the perspective that cultures are to be respected before they are to be critiqued. Otherwise, they won't be open to hearing the critique. Being too critical inhibits change, and it's that, she says, which is stopping the rise of feminism and equal rights in the Muslim world. <laughs>